You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello out there in uh, archaeology podcast land. This is Dr. Alan Garfinkel. I'm the president and founder of the California Rock Art Foundation. And what we do is we identify, evaluate, manage, and conserve rock art both in Alta, California and in Baja, California. We conduct field trips. We have trainings, exercise. We do research. And in every way possible, we try to preserve, protect, and coordinate treasures of Alta and Baja California rock art, of which there are many and diverse. We also work closely with Native Americans and uh, partner with them to recognize and protect sacred sites. So for more info about the fabulous California Rock Art Foundation, you can go to carockart.org. Also, I'm I'm open to give me a call, 805-312-2261. We would uh, welcome sponsorship or underwriting, uh, helping us to defray the costs of our podcasts. And also membership in California Rock Art Foundation. And of course, donations since we are a 501c3 nonprofit scientific and educational corporation. God bless everyone out there in podcast land. You're listening to the Rock Art Podcast. Join us every week for fascinating tales of rock art, adventure, and archaeology. Find our contact info in the show notes and send us your suggestions. Hello out there in archaeology podcast land. This is your host for the uh, Rock Art Podcast, episode number 74. We're going to hear from Cynthia Waldman, who's going to tell us about her journey in writing children's books that integrate Native American theology, religion, rock art, and uh, some important messages that uh, transform one's soul. You don't want to miss this one either. So welcome out there in archaeology podcast land. This is your host, Dr. Alan Garfinkel, for the 74th episode of the Rock Art Podcast. And we're blessed and honored to have Cynthia Waldman. She's a uh, astounding author, authoress, <laughs> if, that's the, if that's the right word, who uh, has written several books, three, and these are mainly children books that are thematically tied to Native Americans and their remarkable uh, they tell uh, stories, they're inspirational and uh, transformational in some ways, and they uh, also surround certain key elements that are very much in alignment with our study of rock art and our study of uh, sacred narrative and understanding the theology, the religious precepts and metaphors for uh, Native people. And uh, we'll get into the details of this shortly. Cynthia, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hello, Alan. Thanks for having me. Oh, God bless you. I'm so glad that you were able to jump in so quickly. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. So it's been a while since we've, you know, sort of had a chance to chat. Cynthia has come along on uh, a number of tours and and uh, associated lectures and other things along those lines. And she's helped me and I've helped her with uh, some of her research on uh, some of her books. So the, the first question I always ask is, if you could kind of give us a, a thumbnail sketch, uh, maybe some word pictures of how you got involved with writing of children's books and where that came from and uh, what, you know, how that evolved with you. And obviously you're passionately involved in, in the subject matter and what, uh, what led to that sort of interesting development. Okay. Well, I think, you know, I have always had a love of books. When you talk to any writer, you know, they talk about how their childhood was filled with books. And mine was too. When I was young, I read the Iliad and Odyssey. And then I just scrounged around and, and just developed this love of literature. One of my very favorite books that I found in the basement of my grandmother's house was called Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. And it's about nature, and that just kind of reinforced my love of nature. And so my three books all have a natural element. Nature is really part of the environment in those books. And then as time went on, I also, of course, always had an interest in indigenous culture. I think because, you know, the indigenous peoples live so close to the earth, and I loved nature. And so that just kind of grew into my interests. And... Third, well, I think I, I covered all three things, actually, books, nature, and indigenous culture. 
And then I was a teacher, and that's how I got into children's books. So I had many uh, kind of a circuitous path to it. I did other jobs before. I even worked on the Viking mission to Mars on the biology team and um, searching for life on Mars and worked in the space program for many years and moved around a lot. But I finally ended up being a teacher and that, you know, developed into my really passion for children's books because I was always reading them to the kids, obviously. And so that all came together to be this passion. And finally, after living many places, I ended up in Tehachapi, California and living in a canyon called Sand Canyon. And there the indigenous peoples lived and for many years, and some still live in the area, of course. And it was the winter home of the Kauai Sioux. And suddenly I found myself just surrounded by artifacts, pounding holes where the, the people pounded their acorns, little bits of arrowheads, shirt, you know, that they made their arrowheads out of, just surrounded by and just exquisite beauty. And that just started me in on wanting to write books with an indigenous character. And then on top of that, part of the canyon has a beautiful pictograph and that was to become a state park. And I got involved in that right at the beginning. That was 1993. And that's how, that's how I got involved even further in the subject and began to delve into it and learn a lot, make friends with some of the Kauai Sumua people who helped me. And it just went on from there. So the Kauai Sioux, for those uh, who are listening in and may not know, are a Southern Paiute uh, speaking culture. They're, an, they're a native California Indian group that uh, both lived in the Tehachapi Mountains, but also in the Western Mojave Desert and uh, still to this very day live there. The place Sand Canyon is a very important one for the for the native people and the uh, site what they call Tomokani which is a state historic park is actually the creation site for the Kauai Sioux and it's layered it's a tapestry of sacred narrative and beauty and wonder as well as being a, a habitation site and it's a I think it's a wondrous place in many ways isn't it Cynthia? Yeah, it is. It's it's absolutely beautiful. If you've ever been to Joshua Tree for people who live in California, there's a section with all the jumble of rocks. And that section where the creation cave is, is a jumble of rocks that are many are formed to look like animals. And they're considered to be guardians. So you'll have a, a horned lizard a rock, you'll have a rabbit shaped rock, you'll have a coyote shaped rock. And you'll have a tortoise-shaped rock, all kinds of rocks in the area. So you're going into this absolutely gorgeous geologic space. Then when you get to the cave that's up there, you know, it's a, like you said, it's part of the sacred narrative of the Kauai Sinua people. There's a rock baby who keeps painting over, who has painted all these paintings. They've been there forever, according to the people. And it's also part of the, you know, their stories that took place there. If you read the narratives of the people, they say that grizzly bear gathered all the animal people so that they could all decide what they wanted to be. And there's different versions of that story, of course. Some say that coyote gathered the animal people, but they decided what animal they were going to be. They decided that deer who got the short end of the stick was going to be food. And grizzly bear would go in and out of there. And I believe that was also an opening into the underworld. So it's Absolutely. A, it's an app. Yeah, it's a, an amazing place. There's so many stories about it. The Kauai Sioux elder, Andy Green, who helped, who named the park Tomokani, which means winter home. He also would tell stories about the place because he lived there. He lived on that site. It was sheltered from the cold. It didn't have as much fog as the sites a little bit further west. And it was a great place to stay warm. It had a spring and they could gather, let's see, pine nuts in the fall and and walk around the whole area to gather. The, the acorns wouldn't have been there. You know, acorns are a very important food source of the indigenous Californians. But there were acorns outside of Sand Canyon that they could gather not far. So it was just a great spot. And Andy tells of his grandmother who went up there, didn't leave the proper offering once, went into the cave 
and got chased out by a bear. <laughs> so that was <laughs> many stories. But he loved living there in a connie with his grandmother on the hillside. A connie being a circular hut, you know, made out of willow and covered with any kind of brush. Usually they used rabbit brush there to cover. And there was a spring. He, there was watercress there to eat. There were nettles to eat and to one thing that you could do with nettles, if you had arthritis, you could hit yourself with them and the stinging would be like a counter pain so you wouldn't feel the arthritis. So he would whip his grandmother back with that, he said. And just, you know, it was a, it was a, great, it was a great spot to live for the most part. And you've been living there for how long? I myself have been living there for 30 years. Oh my <laughs> word. Wow. Yeah. I had, I had no idea. Yeah, I fell in love with it when I first saw it. It was wow. like, I couldn't believe it existed. It was almost like I imagined it into existence because my husband and I, I wanted to move out of the city. I liked the wilderness and he wanted to be in the desert. I wanted to be in the mountains. And so it was like a perfect combination because it's kind of like the desert in the mountains. It's arid, dry, very Western, you know, cliffs co covered with lichen, every kind of rock. Green sandstone, you know, purple sandstone, pink sandstone, church. I mean, you can walk down the road and find petrified palm. Well, I, I also, besides rock art, I also love just plain rocks. So that was a reason why I, I feel very privileged to be able to live there. And of course, there's pounding holes everywhere, like I described before, and artifacts everywhere. And a beautiful mountain, was, uh, one of the southernmost Sierra mountains I can see. And it's just... You know, it's not everybody's cup of tea, fortunately. That's why a lot of people don't live there, but I adore it. Yeah, it's a remarkable place. Yeah. So sort of, uh, I guess, entwining a number of your passions, what made you decide to uh, take a foray and begin writing books? And how did that, how did that develop? How did you learn to do such a, an amazing thing as writing a book for children? Well, I always wanted to. I would have done it earlier if I could have figured out how to live. <laughs> you know, I needed to have a job. So it took me a long time. But while I was working as a teacher, I went back to school and got my Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing and chose children's because I was a teacher and knew and I'd already started to develop the first book um, called The Butterfly Basket. And so that's pretty much how it all started right there. I just had always wanted to do it. I never had the chance. I took the chance <laughs> and I started. And that's, that's what you have to finally do. And that's what I did. So your first book was called The Butterfly Basket. What was that about? Well, that was inspired by an actual basket. And the indigenous Californians, of course, are known for their beautiful baskets. I mean, the Spanish, even when the Spanish came, they mentioned it. And the baskets are, you know, hard to make. I took a, tried to take a basket weaving class by a basket weaver named Mary Claw, who's wonderful. And I found it to be so difficult. I mean, there are so many steps that you have to take to make one of these baskets because you don't have any of the any of the materials you have to gather all the materials you have to strip all the materials you have to get them into the forms that you use and then you have to after that takes a tremendous amount of time it's a lot of fun and then you have to actually make the baskets and weave the baskets which takes a lot of skill she taught us how to do that and i got very interested and then there was this basket there was a basket collector and she, unfortunately, was killed in a car accident. And nobody knew what happened to her basket collection. And we have a wonderful historian in Tehachapi. Her name is Del Troy. And she went online and found, managed to find the baskets. Well, she managed to find this one basket. And it was a butterfly basket. It's woven with butterflies. I think they use bracken fern, actually, it says, to do the darker colors. But um, so it's very symmetric. It's a pretty large basket. And I was able to actually go to the collector who owns it. And he let, let me actually even touch this basket, which is a magical experience. So this basket was woven by a Kwayasu woman. And it 
just inspired the whole story because I began to imagine this girl who's about to lose her basket. And because they were actually sold, the women would come and travel by foot many, many miles to a store in near Tehachapi and other places where they could sell these baskets because for a time they were, you know, a way for the people to make money. So she's going to lose her basket and her friend Sarah figures out a way that she can save it. You know, the two girls just become fast friends, an indigenous girl, Lena, and then Sarah, a girl from the city who has found herself in the middle of this canyon in the middle of nowhere and is too scared to even go outside at first. Lena teaches her all about the beauty of living in Sand Canyon called Coyote Canyon in my book. And then Sarah helps Lena save her basket that's about to be sold. So that's the story, and that was the inspiration. But also, it was a story about the loss of culture, because, you know, when you lose the baskets and they leave your area, you're losing some of your culture. But also, there was a loss of language. Language, we all, you know about the language and how important it is to save these languages. And at the time I wrote the book, there were only a handful of native speakers, and they helped me with the book. And I tried to put quite a bit of the native Nua language into the book. But now there's only one native speaker left. So that has been quite quite a change, you know, over the years, the number of native speakers. So one left. But it was in the story, you know, part of it was, you know, trying about the importance of keeping the language. Although the overall theme was about grief and the two girls helping each other deal with grief. So. And you've gone on to uh, work on her craft more than just the butterfly basket, haven't you? Yes, two more. The next one, which is also out, is called Turning Gold. Now, the Kauais who did not live on a reservation, some went to the Fort Tejon Reservation. But for the most part, the Kauais people did not. And they had to fight to stay in on their land, which was not a reservation, just to stay in town because they wanted to clear the army came by and wanted to clear them out. I'm not sure of all the details of this story, but there's a story about how they had to hide in the rocks near Tom in the Tomokani area. Let's stop right there for just a moment. This is the first uh, segment, and I think that's a wonderful place, sort of a cliffhanger, <laughs> to uh, let the uh, listeners think about some of the pictures we've painted. And we'll uh, pick it up on the flip-flop and continue our our story. Thank you, gang. Looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field? Then check out an introduction to paleoradiography, a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines. Created by archaeologist, radiographer, and lecturer James Elliott, the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education. It is approved by the Register of Professional Archaeologists and the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists as four hours of training. So don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development. For more information on Pricing and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P A L E O imaging.com and check out the link in the show notes. Welcome back to uh, episode 74 on your Rock Art Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Alan Garfinkel. And uh, we have Cynthia Walbert that's uh, talking to us today about her um, passion and love and success in the world of writing. She is an author of children's books that uh, often focus on Native American themes and sort of entwine rock art and sacred narrative into the stories that she has developed. And that they're beautiful and compelling and wonderful. Cynthia, take it away. And let's continue talking about that uh, second book of yours. How about that? Well, I should finish the story about the crying rocks because that explains how the Kwaisu, the Nua, had tried to stay in their own territory. Please. So the cavalry or the army came by and they tried to get them out and the women had to hold on to their babies and keep them from crying. And this was often not a very good outcome. So this is the reason why they fought to stay in their own land and their own communities. And so they aren't reservation group. And what they would do is, you know, just work in the community as 
cowboys, vaqueros, housekeepers having their own businesses, whatever. And then, so at the time of my second book, Lena, her uncle, and is working at the cement plant there, which is still there. It's a plant that actually first was developed in order to get cement for the California aqueduct. And it's the cement was also sent out to the Hoover Dam, then called the Boulder Dam and other places. And the cement plant is still there. It's still a big employer in the community. And in the second book, Lena moves there along with Sarah in order to go to school. And they live on the opposite side of the tracks because this is how it really was. And so in this book, there's not so much about the culture, although there is something about the culture, but it's about how in within the past hundred years, it was it ha- took place in the 1930s, how a young girl like that would have to integrate into the society and what they had to do about the prejudice that arise. And the two girls are separated physically and they're separated in other ways. And they have to figure out what to do to heal their community and to find a way back together again, despite the prejudice that existed. And they managed to do it. So that book's about the power of girls. And so it's not your typical, you know, story that you would expect. Many indigenous stories take place on reservations and things like that. And this is not that way. So that's the second book and it's called Turning Gold. And then the third book, which is not out yet, called Saving Coyote, that one, well, you, Alan, gave me a lot of help with that one. Sarah and Lena actually go into the world of the narratives, the sacred narratives of the Kauai people. And so part of the research I did was fun. I got to go down to Little Petroglyph Canyon on a field trip with you. And when I walked down into it, I felt like I was walking to a graphic novel. I had already been reading the mythology and the narratives, and I just felt like I had gone into the underworld of one of the, I don't know if you, well, the animal master, you call him, named Yawera. Yes. And I felt like I was, Yawera lives in an underworld. And I felt like as I walked down into this landscape, which is very deep with these straight up walls just painted with all these paintings of the, what do you call it? You wear a, the, yeah, they're, they're rock drawings and they're, yeah, and the, they're, and they're, they're covered with imagery. And uh, yes, um, many of them are what we call decorated animal human figures that uh, certainly are, are prototypic or hallmarks of such creatures. How's that? Yeah. So they were there all over the place and they just seemed to come out of the story about Yawera being a healer in the underworld and the animal master. I felt like I was walking into his world where he lived, his underworld. I want to just jump in briefly and tell, and tell the listeners that Cynthia is absolutely off the charts brilliant in the way that she had an epiphany about that, that I've been going into this canyon for about 40 years and had never thought about it in that way. But what happens with this canyon, so that the, le- the listenership understands, it daylights on the valley floor, but it goes down, it, and you cannot see the canyon from the valley floor because it's, it's embedded and goes deeper and deeper, channeling itself uh, and ultimately dropping out of the side of the canyon into a waterfall and then down into the valley below. So what I heard from Cynthia was that, well, Alan, you're missing this. <laughs> this is a this is a three-dimensional story here. This is the immersive experience. And all the pictures relate back to one of the, you know, hallmark narratives, the nature of the cosmology, the religious metaphor, the theology of the indigenous people. And I think she's on to something very important. So I had that strong feeling. And then you, I started imagining, I, I've never been able to be there at night, of course, but you can imagine it would be very dark. You know, the you would be looking up at the dark vault of the sky with some of the stars, and it would be as if you were in an underworld, as if you were underground. You get that feeling. 
And we even saw there's a even a little side room that had these drawings on them that looked like drawings of medicine bags. Well, in the story, you wear as a healer and you can get the, the sacred songs, the healing songs and the healing items out of these medicine bags. So I incorporated all that into the story. And so the story, two girls have to go into the underworld to heal one of them. And so that whole underworld situation is in there. And in order to actually save, they have to save Coyote. In order to save Sarah, they have to save Coyote. That's why the book's called Saving Coyote. Well, as you know, if you know anything about the stories of indigenous Californians, Coyote is the big trickster and he's huge in the stories. And he's huge in the Nuwa stories. You know, it's just all about how they save Coyote after that. And so they're back in the before time and they actually go into these real narratives that the people have told for thousands of years. And these two girls enter into them and they become a part of the narrative. And they learn something from Coyote and Coyote learns something from them. And eventually, of course, they do save him. And there's one element in these, you know, the people, they're, they're animal people that live there in the before time. You know, they're kind of part animal, part people. When you read the narratives, it can be confusing. You know, what do they look like? But sometimes they get down on all fours and run around like a regular animal that, or they can be standing up and kind of their hands might turn into paws. It's just very interesting to think about. I visualized it, you know, more like they look more like animals that can walk around on two feet, but it's it's interesting. And there's one element that's unique I read by Maurice Sigmund. He's um, somebody who, one of the people who collected the, the narratives, the stories. And he said a unique item is the star shirt. None of the other stories from the other groups that he knew about had this thing called a star shirt. So I made the star shirt a really integral part of the story. One of the things they have to do is learn how to save Coyote and they also have to get a star shirt. So, so that's the third one. And I'm just very grateful for all the help I've had through the years. I've had a lot of help from the, from all kinds of people. You are one person and the Nua people, the twice who helped me, especially, well, with all three books, you know, especially they gave me a lot of help with the language on the first book. So I just, I don't know. I, I hope everybody enjoys these books. So what is your favorite thing? What is your, the lesson learned or sort of the takeaway from working on three different books that you've done so far? What's been the most inspirational or the most important lesson that you've learned by having to craft these books? Boy, that's a hard question, Alan. <laughs> what's the most important lesson? Or, or what's a lesson? Not the most important, but, but what's, what's some of the lessons or some of the things that you're most thankful for in terms of this journey you've had in, in fashioning three different books? Well, I think I've grown up and, you know, as I've grown up and matured as a human, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, it's taken me 10 years to write all three of these books. Yeah, I know it has. Yeah. It's quite a while. Yeah. Well, not quite 10 years, but almost. Yeah. And so, you know, I've changed as a human being over the course. And I think that the books have become a little more mystical with each telling. You know, I was, and it depends on what I was interested in at the time. I think I was very interested in the basket making and took the basket making class and the culture and the language and what was going on at first. And so that one's more solid, but it, all three of my books actually have quite a mystical connection because that one does too. The mom's, the mom's always there, even though the mother has passed away. And that's why there's grief in the first story she's still there in many ways. She's there as a butterfly. She's there in the butterfly basket. You know, the girls are there together in the spirit of the basket because their spirit, since they both helped with the basket, is woven into it. And so there's all kinds of kind of mystical philosophical elements. The second one was more realistic. I mean, I actually was able to interview a bunch of people that lived in this town called Monolith, which was the inspiration for the book. I call it town proctor and you know it is a made-up book but you know it was inspired by things that really happened some things that really happened and you know most of it was totally made up but that had to do with the ongoing racism that we're always fighting about you know and the power i wanted to give girls or anyone who read it children the feeling that they could 
were powerful enough to solve a big problem like that. And then finally, I think the third book became the most mystical because, you know, we were at the time of all of this upheaval and politics and while I was writing it. And Coyote is a trickster. He reminded me of a certain person I considered to be a trickster. And that inspired me to just kind of try to see what there's a trickster. What can be good about this person? How can I feel <laughs> compassion for this person? Uh-huh. You know? There has to be a way to feel compassion. And so uh-huh. that, that was the journey because the girls have to discover that it's love and compassion that saved Coyote. It's not wow. criticizing him or anything like that. It's, it's, you know, they want to criticize him. They want to think that they're nothing like him. But in reality, they find out that they have coyote inside of themselves and that everybody does. Sounds like there's, there's some serious lessons yeah. in the books that people can take away from. And there are parallels in our own lives, right? Right, exactly. And there was definitely a parallel in my life, you know, to what I was thinking and growing. And I felt like Coyote was with me every step of the way in that third book. You know, he was there. He teaches the girls a thing or two in the book. And of course, he was teaching me a thing or two at the same time. I can understand how people, you know, to to people who tell these stories, these aren't stories, they're real. And I, and I think writers go through that too. Your characters become real and they become like real people. And, and Coyote became very real to me and he's still a part of my life. And I, you know, you, instead of saying, you know, nobody should say they're perfect, you know, that's what it's about. You know, everybody has all kinds of sides to them. And so that's what this was about. And Coyote you know, there's something to be learned from that side too. If it's, you, you could call it your shadow side, there's something to be learned because it's not all bad. You know, you can love it. There's, you know, all of the aspects of you need to be, to be owned and loved. And that's really what the story is about. And that's what the girls learn. Sounds like one of the themes are about acceptance, correct? Yeah. It's about acceptance. Acceptance. The yeah. total who you are and who everyone else is, you know, about yeah. acceptance. So, yeah. Yeah. I say acceptance is the answer to all of my problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we've, we've talked about that before. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, this is the second uh, segment and it's a great place to uh, break and uh, see you all in the flip flop gang. And we'll, Try to tie a tie a bow around this one and, and try to integrate it into some of the studies of rock art that I've done. And we'll talk about it from a perspective of Cynthia as well. See you shortly. Welcome back, all you archaeology podcasters, to the 74th episode of uh, the Rock Art Podcast. We're here with Cynthia Waldman, tremendous author, talking about Native American books that she's done. And I think in this particular segment, we're going to talk about a, a remarkable rock art site that uh, exists and was uh, partly the focus of Cynthia's work on her uh, third and forthcoming book. How about that, Cynthia? Sounds good, Alan. So here's how it goes, folks. There happens to be a very unusual and remarkable site that exists, a, a rock art site. And rock art sites typically are impressive, yes, and have uh, certain attributes. But this one is impressive for a variety of reasons. One is it's one of those sites that the native people have told us the name of the site. So it's Yahuera Kanina. And this particular site, besides having, you know, a remarkable sort of environmental context and an impressive uh, set of attributes or characteristics, it also has a very robust set of oral traditions, sacred narratives, call it mythology, that surround it. We have... I don't know, almost a dozen different narratives that are parallel that go along with this painting site that explain to us who is being depicted, what went on, and what is the story surrounding this site. How about that, uh, Cynthia? Yeah, go ahead. I'll let you take the lead on this. (laughs) So if I was to, to, you know, sort of talk about the site itself is called Yahuera Canina. It means the home of the animal master or mistress. And this home is an unusual place. It's an island of limestone, literally an island. It's a, it's a pillar 
I think it stands some 30 feet tall. Is that correct? Or is that uh, something along those lines, Cynthia? I'm not sure, Alan. I have actually, because it's on private property, yeah. I've only seen photos. All I've these seen, seen it in photos. Yeah, so, but, it, but it is a pillar and it is split in two and, and water runs out of it. And there's a painting on it of an animal human figure and also two snakes on either side of the of that main figure and a number of other spirit figures in concentric circles and other elements. The, the main figure is about four feet tall. And uh, Maurice Zygmunt, who's the famous anthropologist, ethnographer, who uh, documented this site, in his w- research, he never put two and two together. He had a whole inventory of the narratives, sacred narratives, the, the stories that went along with this. And he did it as ethnogeography, talk about a place like this but never connected the dots. I don't think he ever visited it, nor did he know its precise location. So fast forward, when we discovered it, it became more and more transparent that what we're looking at was in fact the site of the entrance to the animal underworld. So we have a, a limestone pillar that's broken in two and kind of water that comes out of it. It's a rather wet place. And it also is a natural, what would you call it? Not cavern, but a natural amphitheater. And other, uh, one of the prominent individuals that uh, study what's called archaeoacoustics, the study of sound and the study of its relationship to archaeology, went and visited this site and documented and verified substantively, that when you stand in front of the site and talk, it echoes. It's not just a singular echo, it's a double echo. And I wrote an article with uh, Stephen Waller. He has been one of the interviewees or scholars that uh, have been part of our canvas of uh, various individuals who have greeted me in this program. And he talks about how remarkable it is that the stories themselves echo for and talk about sound. It's the sound of the hooves of the deer. It's the sound of the animals as they're talking, the echoes, the sounds, the um, reverberations. They're all identified in these stories. And so he felt that there was a relationship between those stories and the concept of sound as part of the fabric of this supernatural spot. Does that make any sense, uh, Cynthia? Yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with his work, and I did hear that really excellent podcast with him, which I found to be fascinating. And, yeah, I I took the pictures that I saw because I never got to go there, but one of the pictographs seemed to be, to me, looked like a coyote knocking to try to get in. Uh And so I incorporated that into the story and I incorporated the whole, the whole sacred narrative into the story. But also it's interesting what you said that it's limestone because, you know, limestone is where caverns are, you know, yes. cave caverns are. So who knows, you know, maybe there is a cave or a cavern under there somewhere if it's a limestone outcropping. It was just a picture that took my imagination away and I'd already had, you know, read the very wonderful narrative that goes with it. So the way the, the way the narrative goes is there's a person who's sick or frustrated yeah. or, or having uh, problems and he decides to visit the animal underworld and Yahwera, who's the animal mistress or master. And the way you get into the cavern was supposedly with some sort of a rope or some sort of a ladder or some sort of a means of moving yourself down into this cavern. Now, it's not so easy once you get in because it's guarded. Yes. Isn't it, Cynthia? Who is it guarded by? <laughs> yes, it's guarded by oh, well, snakes. One nice little, it, the snakes are actually the door to Yawara's house. Yes. So, yeah, so first you have to, you greet a gopher snake, which they're not so bad. But then there's some big snake, mythical snake that's huge. I mean, there's different variations of him. Rattlesnake um, as big as a log. Yeah. Or, or, you know, there's all kinds of stories about Yes, this. yes. 
and they have to get by him and then they have to get by bears, the grizzly bear. Yep. You know? and yep. So, yeah, it's a, it's it's a lot for them to have to do before they finally meet the terrifying Yawera. Right. So it's a grizzly bear and a brown bear. Yes. They finally, finally get through and then they meet the uh, wizard Yawera. And Yahuera is both a, a, a man and a woman. If, if, if a man dreams of Yahuera, it's a woman. If a woman dreams of Yahuera, it's a man. And he or she is wearing some sort of a, uh, I think, a quail feather robe, as right. I understand it. Right. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. And, and the animal itself is an animal human that I think is like some sort of a uh, raptor. Isn't it some a yellow bird or raptor? Well, I think some people said it was a raptor, and some said it was a quail. So yes, yes. I went with the quail, you know, but it could be either. But I do mention that it could. You know, some say it's a raptor, right? And and this quail metaphor is embedded big time with this uh, story. So yeah, but, but Yahweh is supposed to have been rather hospitable because he or she gives the uh, visitor. A bowl of food. Yeah. Uh, actually, he gives them uh, all various things. It can be just an acorn cup or something else, but they give them like one nut. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's an en- but it's an endless nut yes, because yes. The, no matter how much they eat, it keeps reappearing on itself. Yeah, so you have a basket with one little nut, right, and you can keep right, it. Right, right. Frustrating way to eat, but yes, yeah. Yes, yes. So, yeah. so once, once someone's full, it's like a Jewish mamala, you know, keep SS because to hate, keep eating. And so then, you, then the, uh, the visitor says, uh, you know, okay, I'm full now. What's next? Well, then Yahuera ushers this visitor into a room. Yeah. And, what's in, and what's in the room? The medicine bags full of right. medicine, songs, you know, items, just all kinds of things. So of course the, my girls pick a song, but um, yeah, there's yeah. all things in those in those medicine bags and and the song is the medicine and yes. so yes. Yeah. yeah so once one picks a song and says goodbye to yahuera they have to uh find a way out of this animal underworld and yeah I, one of the things we forgot to tell you listeners is that yahuera's job is to revivify transmogrify resurrect the spirits of the animals after they have been killed and bring them back because, of course, they're immortal, and they they come back through portals, through holes in right. the rock, or through through uh, ponds, or or springs, or or other means of of sort of bringing them back each spring. Right, and yeah, and the deer are down there. The deer, which deer are, are there, yes, yes, yeah, uh-huh. they're the main food. They're down there in the underworld, and with you know the girls see them, and and the portal. It's very science fiction-y, you know. <laughs> My husband, when he read the book, said, oh, you got to change that portal. That's too cliche. And I'm like, but no. that's kind of cliche. That is actually in the story. It is? You know, the, the, the kind of portal with like the translucent covering. Oh, yeah. That, oh, yeah. That was from their real story. So right. I said, I'm not they, changing they go, they go through a veil, which is translucent. It looks yeah. like a little waterfall, but they yeah. don't get wet. Right. And, and then they leave. But they don't exit at the same place. They exit somewhere else and they find themselves either at Red Rock Canyon or at Little Lake or somewhere else where they have to then find their way back to their original entrance or back to their home. Am I correct? Yeah. Yes. And then when they get there, they're not allowed to tell anyone for three days. No. Or they die, which some just can't can't help themselves and they yes. tell it's yes. all over. But yeah. But what but what they find is this this revelation, this experience, and using the song transforms them, heals them physiologically, spiritually, intellectually, in every way. And yeah. by this transformational experience, they then get better. Yeah, exactly. Now what's interesting about all this when we talk about the layered approach is there is a um, ceremony, religious ceremony where the uh, medicine persons help people to get better or to get a, um, a personal pet 
or a guardian spirit as we might understand it. And the way they do that is what's called the Jimson Weed Ceremony. It's for men and for women, and they can go through it at, at different times. And they brew that Jimson Weed, it's Datura, in a, in a little basket, a, a necked basket that has quail feathers all the way around it. And it has a rattlesnake design on it, and they brew it. And it's called, uh, what's that basket called? It has, oh, the Terragabadi. And Tara means quail in, mm-hmm. in uh, Kauaisu. It's an onomatopoeic. poetic. It's from the sound that the quails make. Tara, 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 Tara. <laughs> yeah, well, I've heard different things, but some say it's, no, no, tell it's, me. The sound, it's the sound that they make when they when they are flying. They okay they that really loud noise. Um, okay, yes, could be either thing, but um, yeah, no, no, that both of those sound sound yeah. could be correct. Yeah, but the name Tara means quail. Yeah, in their language, yes. Mm-hmm. So there's a a very involved multi-layered element to the story because it's a story of transformation and, and uh, renewal and, and all of the above. And it's one that also may relate to the ceremony and rituals associated that transform one throughout their life. How about that? Yeah. And this story, Saving Coyote, has that transformational. I mean, they do save the Sarah does get saved through the doctor's song, you know, it has an amazing transformational effect. So that story is a story of transformation too, that goes along. They, they walk hand in hand together, the narratives of the Nua people and Sarah, they all, they're all like woven together, you know, like a basket and um, come out at the end, but have the same kind of feeling, you know, so I think you learn a lot about the culture and at least the, the narratives by reading that third book and something about the rock art too. And there's something else to be said about the science and religion of indigenous people. Yeah. Because these days we're, we're finding more and more that some of the psychotropics and some of the means, the methodologies, the particular ways in which native people cured are actually very efficacious. And scientists have found that if people who are sick or depressed or have some sort of physiological problems, often they can be healed by native doctors using those same types of plants and other means, which is rather remarkable, I think. So we've come sort of full circle to at least at some point begin to recognize the validity and importance of the native means of healing. Yeah. And that museum near the zoo in Los yes. Angeles, the Western museum has a wonderful video of a healer and oh, wow. of an indigenous healer. She's famous. And I was looking for a long time. Where is this video? How can I get a hold of it? Mm-hmm. And it's right there. So anyone who wants to see an actual mm-hmm. healing going on can go to that museum. <laughs> no, that's amazing. And, the, and again, watch it th- through, through the internet we're finding that it's a, there's an amazing compendium and almost a transformation going on in the medical profession, a revelation showing us that there's a way through and the validity of the psychotropic elements of native healers has great validity and power. And I think on that one, we'll call it quits. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, well, Cynthia having me yeah it was a play it was an absolute pleasure okay gang see you on the flip-flop see you next week god bless thanks for listening to the rock art podcast with dr alan garfinkel and chris webster find show notes and contact information at www.arcpodnet.com forward slash rock art Thanks for listening, and thanks for sharing this podcast with your family and friends.
This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.